This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Hello? Hmm. <coughs> <coughs> oh, oh, oh. Ah, hello, my oh, good man. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Oh, how do you do, sir? Yes, yes, yes. How do you do? Uh, <coughs> I am Sir Topham Hat. <gasps> Not the Sir Topham Hat. Controller of the Northwestern. The one and only. <laughs> uh, now, I'm in need of a new engine on my railway. A shunter. And I understand you have a selection of really useful ones here. Oh, yes, sir. Let me take you to the workshop. We've got all sorts of engines. This one's a real looker. Very classy. Hmm. No, not a tender engine. Uh, not now, anyway. I need a shunter. This one just arrived last week. New boiler, too. Can haul any train. No, no. Uh, too big for what I'm in need for. I say, don't you have any small tank engines? Hmm. Well... I do have one more engine. Oh, he's in the side shed. He's been there for a while. He's a bit of an oddball, really. I don't even know who his make it is. Hmm. Let me see him. Right, follow me. Hello? Hello? Hmm. That's the one. I say, you're a smart little engine. Four wheels, too. My name is Sir Topham Hat. What's your name? Oh, haven't a name, sir. Never was given one. No name? Well, every engine deserves a name. I need a shunting engine for my big yard. An engine who can be really useful. If I choose you, will you work hard? Oh, yes, sir. Of course, sir. Please, sir. That's a good engine. <laughs> I think I will call you Percy. How do you like that? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Ha <laughs> ha! My good man, steam this engine up. I'll take him. <laughs> Percy is a young, small, green, four-wheeled, saddled tank engine. He loves playing jokes, but they can get him into trouble. He can be rather cheeky, rather vengeful, and sometimes just a little naive. He's also rather quick to anger when he's wrongly treated, and when he gets mad, he explodes. He once worked in the yard at the big station, but has since relocated to the Farquhar branch line where he now works with Toby and his eventual best friend, Thomas. When he's not pulling trucks to the harbor or the quarries, Percy can be found pulling the mail train, or having an argument with Harold the helicopter, or even perhaps pulling a prank on a snobby big engine who deserves it. He also gets stuck in water quite frequently. I don't know why this is a recurring thing. Without question, Percy is the most requested character I have ever had for Sodor's Finest. I know you all have been waiting patiently for this one, and today, finally, we will be deep diving into just what this little green guy is all about. Prepare yourselves for a nice, lengthy Sodor's Finest, because we have quite a lot to discuss regarding Percy, the small engine. Every character in Wilbert Audrey's Railway series has a funny reason for existing, and Percy is the exception. Unlike all the other engines, Percy is the only of Audrey's not directly based on an actual engine in real life. He's a real hodgepodge, and that's reflected in Audrey's own original model of Percy, which was a kit bash of a Larco Dockland saddled tank engine. Ultimately, though, it doesn't matter what specific class of engine Percy isn't based on, it's the spirit of what Percy is that matters. And that is a small 040 saddle tank engine, of which were common to big yards and docklands and areas of industry where trucks and coaches had to be sorted. 
In these settings, you'd always see a little 040 tank engine scamping about, peeking in and out of gaps between vans, almost cheekily playing hide and seek. And that, in essence, is what Percy is. Despite this, Audrey does attempt to give an explanation for Percy's origins in the Island of Sodor book, where he states that Percy is a saddle tank built in the early 20th century by the Avonside Engine Company. He was bought second or third hand by the Fat Controller, and prior he was rebuilt several times by previous owners, whom added parts from Hunslet and other builders. A real hodgepodge of parts. Percy not being based on anything in particular also meant there was no reference material for the illustrators. So over the years, Percy has changed in appearance quite a few times, depending on who was drawing him. Percy's first illustrator, Clarence Reginald Dalby, infamously did not get along with Wilbert Audrey. Audrey thought Dalby's illustrations of trains looked rather toy-like, which tracks since Dalby was more of a scenery artist than a train one. The reason he got the job in the first place was that the publishers hired him, and Audrey didn't really have a say. This strenuous relationship was only worsened by the introduction of Percy, who Dalby illustrated like this. When the illustrations for Percy's spotlight book, Percy the Small Engine, came along, Audrey was appalled with what he saw, and wrote to Dalby criticizing his work, labeling his drawings of Percy looking more like a green caterpillar with red stripes more so than an engine. Understandably, Dalby was insulted and resigned. Audrey's little insult to Dalby was not forgotten over the years though, and it eventually made its way into the plot of the much later story, Wooly Bear, where an angry Thomas insults Percy. Ugly indeed! I'm a green caterpillar with red stripes, continued Thomas firmly. You crawl like one too. It's so funny to me that Audrey was really this petty. He had a very odd sense of humor. Nonetheless though, the series trudged on after Dalby's departure. Following him was John Kenny, who drew Percy like this. And after him was Peter Edwards, who drew him like this. This was the finalized version of the character, and he retained this outline for the rest of the books into Christopher Audrey's tenure. Percy's story starts in 1926, in the events of the series' fifth book, Troublesome Engines. This book was published in 1950, amidst a time when labor strikes were occurring on British railways. Inspired by the times, as he always was, Audrey wrote it into his book, in which all three of the big engines, Henry, Gordon, and James, felt mistreated and go on strike, refusing to shunt their own coaches following Thomas's departure for his branch line. We won't shunt like common tank engines. We are important tender engines, if you don't mind. You fetch our coaches for us, and we'll pull them. So there. The Fat Controller's solution to this was that the yard needed another shunting engine. And so he went to find one. He went to a workshop on the mainland, where he was shown all sorts of engines. He stumbled across a little green 040 saddle tank, and he instantly knew that was the one. If I choose you, will you work hard? Oh, yes, sir. That's a good engine, <laughs> I'll call you, um, Percy. He named Percy on the spot and purchased him. The Fat Controller himself drove Percy to Sodor under his own steam, where he was put to work as Tidmouth's new pilot engine. Percy had many adventures as Tidmouth's pilot, including dodging a near collision with Gordon, crashing into a luggage cart while trying to sneak up on the coaches, rescuing James after he crashed into some tar tankers, meeting the Queen herself when she visited, and being fooled by Gordon and James into thinking such a thing as backing signals existed. Nonetheless, Percy worked hard at the station for many years, nearly 30 or so, but come the mid-50s, he was tired, and the workload of the growing railway was becoming too much for him. In 1954, the first Fat Controller, Sir Topham Hatt I, retired, and his son, Sir Charles Topham Hatt, became Controller. Sir Charles went into his new role ready to make some big changes to the railway, and one of his first orders of business was to find a solution to the congestion problem at Tidmouth. Tidmouth's harbour was becoming busier than ever, and it was clear a subsidiary harbour was needed. Sir Charles decided that the abandoned harbour at Knapford on Thomas's branch line would be renovated to accommodate shipping again. 
and he asked Percy to help build it. When Duck, the new Tidmouth pilot engine, arrived in 1956, Percy took his leave to Thomas's branch line, where he helped with Knapford Harbor's reconstruction. Percy's second chapter of life on Sodor began here, and since then he's been a mainstay on Thomas's branch line, sharing a shed at Farquhar with Thomas and Toby. Percy has had many adventures since his arrival here, including daring to go past the danger notice on the old quay at Knapford, with disastrous results, racing Harold the helicopter, braving a flood to keep his promise to Thomas, pretending he was a ghost to spook Thomas, getting stuck in hay, losing control of quarry trucks and colliding with a brake van, running over Tom Tipper's bicycle, chancing a collapsing bridge, accidentally hurling trucks onto Bullstrode, crashing into a coal stage, crashing into a tree branch, and running over a sack of porridge on the line. To say that Percy is accident-prone may be the biggest understatement in history. Percy has interacted with pretty much the entire main cast at some point or another. I can't talk about every dynamic this guy shares, but I will talk about some of the noteworthy ones. Let's first talk about the big engines, who rather often were rude to Percy and saw him as beneath them. A common tank engine, as Gordon would put it. Similarly to Thomas, Percy never took what the big engine said to him too seriously, and let it roll off him. He would either clap back at them with a good comeback, Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain, would play pranks, Hurry up, Gordon! The train's ready! Gordon thought he was late and came puffing out. Ha ha ha! Laughed Percy and showed him a train of dirty coal trucks. Or my personal favourite, scare them. But Percy just went, Whoop! Henry jumped and ran away. That never gets old. While he more or less treated all the big engines pretty equally, there were some genuine moments of kindness between them, like how he and Gordon became friends for a short stint after Gordon rescued him from the mud bank, or how Percy consoled Henry when he returned home from crew. Percy said to him, Never mind, Henry. I'm glad you're home again, and... Quite frankly, I like your whistling. While they all didn't get along most of the time, it's clear that none of them had any real malice towards each other. The big engines found Percy irritating, sure, but they didn't necessarily hate him. He was just their annoying little brother. And in turn, Percy didn't hate them. They were all just victims to his little ploys. Hey, shunting in a yard day in, day out gets monotonous. He's gotta find something to keep him entertained. Do you know what? What? Do you know what? What? Do you know what? Silly. This is a nice segue into Duck, the engine that came to take over when Percy was relocated. Being the little common tank engine of the yard, Percy was always depicted as an underdog, usually stepped on by the big engines. They'd order him around and tell him to do things. Duck, being toughened up coming from the big city of London, of course took offense to this and convinced Percy to join him in leading a strike against them. He respected Percy as a fellow tank engine, and taught him to take charge when he was being belittled. I find it really funny that Percy's tenure at Tidmouth started because of a strike, and also ended with one. How poetic. This story occurs in the first half of Percy's Spotlight book, and becomes a common theme throughout it. Percy learning to stand up for himself. Q. Harold the Helicopter who comes to light in the next story. Ha! I think railways are slow. They're not much use, you know, and quite out of date. This little rivalry between him and Percy is a reflection of the Thomas and Bertie dynamic. A modern helicopter thinks rails are out of date. But Percy and his newfound sense of justice puts him in his place when he beats him in a race. Harold gets his own back, though, when he helps Percy get through a flood, and the two... kind of become friends. Unfortunately, these dynamics shared with Duck and Harold aren't really touched on again in the books, but they are built upon more magnificently in the TV series, but we'll get to that later. Let's talk about Thomas. The classic duo, Thomas and Percy, best of friends. Percy's had an accident. Pooh, who cares? Hmm, well, maybe not the best of friends. 
Every time we see these two together, they're usually arguing. Blue is the only proper color for an engine. I've always been green. I wouldn't want to be any other color. Blue is the only color for a really useful engine. Everybody knows that. Driver says I don't need him now. Don't be so daft, snorted Percy. If you stopped me from doing something nice, would you be a drip, Thomas? You're the drip, answered Thomas crossly. That's not to say Thomas and Percy aren't friends in the books. They are, as shown in Percy's promise when Percy is determined to keep a promise he makes to Thomas. But it's a very different friendship than the TV show portrays. Here, Thomas and Percy are more so work colleagues. They probably would never befriend each other if they weren't forced to work together. And the fun comes from each one trying to one-up the other. It's a fun rivalry because the two are so similar. They're both young, impatient, easily offended, cheeky, and kind of naive. So of course they rub each other the wrong way. It's like putting the same ends of two magnets together. They just don't stick. The best of their rivalry, in my opinion, is the story Ghost Train where Thomas insults Percy for believing in a silly ghost story. Oh, he went on. It makes my wheels wobble to think of it. Pooh, said Thomas. You're just a silly little engine, Percy. Percy, offended, gets his own back one night when he hits a lime cart and gets covered in white. With Toby's help, they convince Thomas he's actually a ghost and spook him. I'll chaff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. Oh, oh dear, exclaimed Thomas. It's getting late. I've no idea. I must find Annie and Clarabelle. And he shot off like a jackrabbit. No character is ever allowed to win, though, because in the very next story, Thomas gets the last laugh when Percy gets stuck in hay. Look what's crawled out of the hay, puffed Thomas as he started away. It's worth being late to have seen you. It's a never-ending push-pull friendship with these two. And quite honestly, it's more entertaining from a storytelling perspective. And dare I say, more real. No one loves everyone they work with, so it's kind of satisfying when that other person messes up. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. And finally, let's talk about Toby. Toby is Percy's actual best friend in the books. They were shown working together even well before Percy was on the branch line. The two share a laugh at James's expense. Look here, Percy. Whatever is that dirty object there? And they joyously tooted their whistles together when the Queen visited. Toby and Percy said, <laughs> Henry and James said, <laughs> But Toby and Percy were too excited to care. And then when Percy's on the branch line, they're more than often shown working together, since they manage most of the goods work on the line. I totally understand why these two would be friends. Toby, as we discussed before, is a very chaotic neutral. He doesn't choose sides, but he'll do whatever if it means he gets a good laugh out of it. Coupled with Percy, who is just cheeky by nature. It's no wonder they team up so often to get a rise out of Thomas. They both get a kick out of it. Toby is also older and more experienced, so he also acts as a guide for the young Percy, someone he can share his frustrations with. I say, Toby, you know that Harold, that stuck-up whirlybird thing? He says I'm slow and out of date. Just let him wait. I'll show him. Hello, Percy, he said. I see Daisy's left the milk again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do. Percy and Toby are kind of like a kid and his fun uncle. There's an age gap there but there's nothing that they wouldn't share with each other. What Percy represents in the Railway series is childhood innocence. Young, curious, and has that childlike sense of justice we all feel in our rebellious years. You're not going to get a darker story about learning your brothers have all been scrapped, or a story arc with deeper themes about character reflections with Percy. But you will get fun, light-hearted stories about racing a helicopter or pretending to be a ghost. He's innocent and he's fun. A certainly memorable contrast to the rest of the cast. What? And definitely a loud one.
Percy's story in the model series, like most of the Audrey characters, follows the books pretty closely at first. Thomas left for his branch line, and the big engines were left to shunt their own trains. They felt mistreated and went on strike. So the Fat Controller went to a workshop to find a new shunter, where he stumbled upon a smart little green engine with four wheels. That's the one, he thought. If I choose you, will you work hard? Oh, sir, yes, sir. That's a good engine. I'll call you Percy. Percy came to the yard, and there he worked for the remainder of season one. While Percy was introduced in the first season, he was not a major player. He got one episode that introduced him, a single lead, and then he just sort of popped in and out after that. Even his facial expression barely changed. Season 2 was Percy's year. This was the season where he really became one of the main characters. He had a full rounded character arc, and many staples of his character were introduced this year. In fact, Percy had the most lead roles of any character, even more than Thomas. Let's dive in. This is the year Percy was promoted from yard pilot to reconstructing the harbor. Would you like to help build my new harbor? Thomas and Toby will help too. Oh yes sir, thank you sir. Duck arrived to take over, and the story plays out just like in the books. Do they tell you to do things, Percy? Yes, they do, answered Percy. Right, we'll soon stop that nonsense. Duck leads a strike, and in turn teaches Percy to stand up for himself. This becomes an ongoing arc for Percy for the rest of the season. He stands up to the big engines. He meets Harold in the next episode and puts his elitist ass to shame when he beats him in a race. We've won! We've won! He shouted. Harold's still hovering. He's looking for a place to land. He and Toby tell off Thomas when he's bragging about whatever. Driver says I don't need him now. Don't be so daft, snorted Percy. And he and Toby team up to pay Thomas out after he insults him. Do let's pretend I'm a ghost and scare Thomas. That'll teach him to say I'm a silly little engine. I'll chuff and I'll puff and I'll break your door in. It's getting late. Oh, oh I've no idea. Oh, I, I must find Annie and Clarabelle. Percy's friendship with Thomas really blossomed this season. They didn't really do much together in season one. I mean, they kind of knew each other, but they never really had a moment where they talked or anything. In fact, you could say Thomas was rather hesitant about Percy, going by this line. Thomas was anxious about Annie and Clarabelle, but both Driver and God promised to take care of them. Season 2 starts their friendship off with a rocky start, it even being the focus of the premiere episode. This whole season, the two are at each other's throats, getting into a tiffy about something. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone, said Thomas. You're like, ugly indeed. I'm green caterpillar with red stripes. You crawl like one too. I don't. Call it Thomas struggling to adjust to changes, if you will. It's very true to the books this season. Season three was another big Percy year, where he once again trumped everyone with the most lead roles. This season really furthered him as a character, giving him stories that take him to places not just on the branch line, and leaning more into the dynamics set up in Season 2 and running with them. More Duck, more Harold, and much more Thomas. We see Percy and Duck working together fairly often in Season 3, featuring two whole episodes where they work at the docks together. Duck, once again, leads a strike, and Percy backs him up. What's all this? demanded Sir Topham Hatt. We're on strike, sir, said Percy nervously. There's a good number of Harold and Percy stories this year, including all new ones like Mail Train, where Percy once again gets the last laugh. You need rails, laughed Percy. They work wonders, you know. Always. And Christmas Adventure, where he calls Harold to help them. Wake up, lazy wings. The mountain villagers need your help. They're stranded. Where's all, replied Harold. Regardless of these two's petty differences, it's nice to see that they don't let them get in the way when there's an emergency. And of course, we got a lot more Percy and Thomas. Last season, it seemed like these two were more so friends reluctantly than anything. But this year, we see them both grow and actually become friends. A team. It's nice how we see Thomas confide in Percy when there's trouble afoot instead of just belittling him. Or how we now trust Percy to get his passengers home. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take the children home. Of course I will, promised Percy. 
and how Percy is determined not to let him down. I promised, he panted. I promised. Contrast that to that earlier line in Season 1 about Thomas not really trusting him with Annie and Clarabelle yet. I'd say Season 3 is really the season Thomas and Percy being friends actually started. It took them a while to warm up to each other, but they got there eventually, just like people in real life. Season 3 was also notable in that it introduced two other major Percy staples. The first we'll touch on is this newfound rivalry with James. That's no excuse, Percy. Nothing should stop us. Sir Topham Hatt relies on us to be on time. And James puffed importantly away. Bossy buffers, muttered Percy. This is interesting because it's not really a thing in the books. It's an invention of the TV series entirely. James and Percy constantly trying to one-up each other. There's no time to lose. James has done too much of that already. It's fun since you got vain and boastful, rubbing up against cheeky and vengeful. And it's even more fun because no one ever really wins in Percy and James stories. I guess Percy needed a new victim now that he and Thomas were friends. It just so happened to be the red guy. The show would continue to play with these two together a lot more in later seasons. The other new staple this year was the mail train. Granted, this was a thing in the books, albeit only for one story, but it was the show that really pushed the idea that Thomas and Percy, and later pretty much only Percy, pulled the mail train. It's followed up on in almost every season of the show following this, even in the CGI seasons. I don't have much to say about this other than I just like the concept. It gives Percy an exclusive responsibility in the series that's totally unique to him, and opens a new door to more story ideas. Season 5 was yet another fantastic year for Percy. Another season where he trumped others with the most lead roles. This season saw Percy at his angriest, at his most put upon, at his boiling point. All the characters have matured by the time we get to Season 5, and Percy has grown into someone who's just kind of tired of it all. Bored with his work. Nothing exciting ever happens. I'm bored, bored, bored. And tired of everyone being so stuck up. Bumpy ride on rotten rails. I'm glad it's over. So am I, said Percy. This whole season is just a giant roast fest for him. Arsdale End. That's my home, replied Toby. That's why I like it, especially when you're there and not here saying I'm silly. It's an interesting development for him, for sure, seeing as he started the show as a happy, wide-eyed scamp. This leads into many stories this year where a disgruntled Percy has to be a real hero and overcome a huge obstacle, such as rescuing Toby from going over the falls, chasing after a runaway train, or being buried alive in an avalanche. Oh my god. He really was the embodiment of the smallest engines have the biggest adventures this year. <laughs> it might also be worth noting that uh, as of this season, Percy's the only engine who's ever gotten some action. And she kissed Percy. <laughs> season six saw even more Percy love. And I'd say that most of the Percy-centric episodes this year were pretty good. Emphasis on most. We got another Percy and Harold rivalry story. I'd have to make too many trips. Then I'd be as slow as Percy. Two more Percy and James rivalry stories. Uh, hello, J J James. Ah! A Percy and Thomas rivalry story. Move aside, Dirty Percy, Chuff Thomas. Don't call me Dirty Percy. And the ever-wonderful Scaredy Engines, which is both a Percy and Thomas story and a Duck and Percy story. Thomas is a real prick to Percy for being on edge at the smelters. Duck, in true Duck fashion, helps Percy pay him out. Their plan works a little too well. He's after me! I don't think he'll be late, said Duck. And Percy and Thomas bury the hatchet at the end. It's these type of slower, character-driven stories I find myself appreciating much more as I get older. However, Season 6, like for most of the characters, sadly, is where I start to notice a downgrade. Nothing too major just yet, but Percy started acting kind of stupid this season. He should be retired, but he doesn't have tires. He's had little dumb moments in the past before. 
I can't see any, said Percy. Where are they? Any what? Ideas above the station. The sky's empty. But season six is where they really started amping this up. What's a demonstration? Demonstration, said Thomas. I'm going to go more into this in the season six retrospective, but it's worth noting that this is the first season written by a team of writers instead of Britt Allcroft and David Mitten being the creative voice behind everything. A totally new team now tasked with churning out 26 new stories every year. So naturally, the writing took a hit. Inconsistencies started rearing their ugly heads. Characters started getting reduced to singular flat personality traits. Gordon became grumpy all the time. Edward is now just old, and the other see him as pathetic now and don't really respect him. And Percy, well, he's the dumb one. It wouldn't be dignified. Dingy fried puzzle, Percy. What's that? This character degradation continued further into the hit entertainment era of the series, where all Percy-centric stories were focused on him being basically a child, usually about him misunderstanding something. The railway inspector arrives today. What's a railway in spectacles? Percy asked. Come on, Percy, really? You don't know what a railway inspector is? Actually believing that Sir Topham Hatt would ever scrap him. He must go to the scrapyards tomorrow. Sir Topham Hatt wants to scrap me, gasped Percy. Or entertaining such silly concepts like a spaceship or a magic carpet. It is a magic carpet. It can fly. You're an idiot. The hit era was very much toned down and aimed for a younger demographic than the previous seasons. So of course those childlike, naive aspects of Percy fit this new mold. And it's mainly what they stuck to. Percy very much became the character that questioned what everything is. So another character would have to spell it out in layman's terms for the audience. What's a museum? asked Percy. Uh, what's a spotless record? whispered Percy. What's restoration? He wished quietly. Sadly, this was pretty much Percy for the rest of the model series. Thomas and Percy's friendship also took a major hit during this time. It went from them being work colleagues turned friends that confide in each other when the going gets tough, to being happy sappy friends that tell each other everything and get depressed when they're apart. Let's compare this season 12 episode, Best Friends, to the much earlier Thomas, Percy, and the Mail Train from Season 3. In this episode, Thomas confides in Percy when he hears bad news. Thank goodness I have a chance to speak to you. Driver says that the person in charge of the mail has complained to Sir Topham Hatt about the delay last night. Tonight we'll just have to be quicker than ever before. And the two work hard together to overcome that adversity. And it holds some weight knowing that they weren't exactly friends in the season before this. Now they're strong characters that have learned to put differences aside to work together as a team. Contrast with Best Friends, where Thomas doesn't tell Percy that he got to pull a special, and Percy is sad about it. He was very upset. Why didn't you tell me, Thomas? I tell you everything. Thomas felt terrible. Good lord, what happened to these two? This new version of their friendship feels so manufactured and fake compared to before. These don't feel like the same characters anymore. This doesn't feel like a real friendship in my opinion. That's not to say there weren't bright Percy moments in this later tenure though. There's a good number of awesome Percy moments in the hit era. I think the best Percy-centric episode of this time is Season 9's Percy and the Oil Painting. In this episode, an insufferable artist keeps insulting the island for not being picturesque enough for his painting. And eventually Percy gets so mad he just tells him off. Everywhere on Sodor is special, and so are the people, and the children, and the engines. We are all special. In Thomas and the Statue, Percy tells Thomas off for boasting so much. No one wants to hear about it anymore. No one wants to talk to you anymore, Percy added crossly. And neither do I! I just love it when Percy gets mad. It's very true to him. I love how much he doesn't care about whatever Thomas is talking about here. Really, Thomas? Yawned Percy. That's safe. And I love how he ignites the teasing of Gordon in respect for Gordon. Rattler Gordon's keeping us all awake, peeped Percy. This feels like the jokey Percy of the early seasons. I'm only noticing now, as I type the script, 
that all of these bright spots are from Season 9 specifically. Someone on the writing team this year really understood Percy. What Percy represents in the model series era of the show is the embodiment of the smallest engines have the biggest adventures. He's a very aspirational character in that sense for the show's target demographic. He is young and naive like the audience watching, and even speaks for them at times. But often shows even a little guy like him can be the biggest of heroes. Whether that adversity he's overcoming is something huge like surviving a landslide, or growing and befriending a work colleague that he didn't get along with originally, it's no wonder that Percy became so instantly popular. I think we all see a little of ourselves in him. Percy's arrival to Sodor was never shown on screen in the CGI series, but his arrival was alluded to in the 2015 movie, The Adventure Begins. But who will fetch our coaches for us, sir? I don't know, Gordon. Perhaps you'll have to fetch your own until I can get another small engine, like Thomas. CGI Percy was really no different from the later model series Percy, at first anyways. Before Mattel and Andrew Brenner and co. came along, all of Percy's episodes were very childlike and silly in concept. Delivering a present on a flatbed, copying Gordon, searching for a monster, delivering a balloon on a flatbed, and trying to befriend animals in the woods. Hello, squirrels! Would you like to be friends with me? Oh my god. Notably, in this era, Percy received the spotlight in a movie for the first time ever in the 2011 movie, Day of the Diesels. Now, I want to give them some credit here for actually shaking things up a bit and letting someone other than Thomas be the lead of a movie. And I want to say the original intentions for this movie were pretty solid. Problem is, the final product is not written well, and it's a concept that they've already done before, and better in the past. It's another Steamies vs. Diesel's conflict again. In this movie, Diesel 10 returns and tricks Percy by befriending him, and using him to achieve his plan of taking over the Steamworks. The Steamworks is ours! It's all ours! The kickoff to all of this was a strain put on Thomas and Percy's friendship. Thomas starts ignoring Percy for a new engine. Percy feels like Thomas doesn't want to be his friend anymore, which provokes him to join the Diesels who are putting on a facade of kindness to him. You're a very special engine, Percy. Why don't you... pop in? There was a good idea in here somewhere, this being the real first big time Thomas and Percy's friendship is tested, but the writing just isn't there. Their friendship again doesn't feel very real. Thomas never seems remorseful for treating Percy badly, and Percy is just a total idiot throughout all of this. Of course the Diesels are up to something, Percy. How blind are you? You don't think it's strange that they're acting so welcoming all of a sudden? The movie itself is a child-friendly allegory for classism and all, and it just doesn't work. It's clunky, and it doesn't feel like the story really goes anywhere. All the Diesels and Steamies work together at the end because Sir Topham Hat told them to, not because they decided to put their differences aside and progress. Overall, a pretty bad movie, and it didn't really do Percy or his friendship with Thomas any favors. There is one bright spot I want to mention, though. An episode that is actually kind of good from this early era. I know, crazy, right? Which is called Percy and the Calliope. In this episode, Percy and Diesel are tasked with taking an old steam calliope to the scrapyard. He believes it still to be useful, so while on the journey there, he tries everything he can to get it working again, and the clock is ticking. His methods are pretty stupid, like did you really think putting coal in the damn thing would make it work again, really? And I can't believe the Calliope was still in one piece after falling off a moving train, but still. Percy's determination here is pretty admirable, butted up against Diesel's reductive condescension. I'm sure I can make this Calliope play. <laughs> Kinda reminds me of earlier stories where characters would stop at nothing to save another from the Cutter's Torch, despite all the odds against them. 
It's Percy's persistence that pushes this episode just over the line into, you know what, this is actually okay territory. For me anyway. In 2012, Mattel bought Thomas and the whole writing staff was overhauled, blah 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 blah. We all know what happened. Point is, everything changed and season 17 is where the writing started to get good again. Percy's stories finally weren't about him being childish or tasked with silly deliveries anymore. They were about him overcoming obstacles. In season 17's Percy's Lucky Day, Percy overcomes having a streak of bad luck. In season 18's Missing Gator, he has to learn to put his fear aside to rescue some trucks in an abandoned mine. In season 20's Letter to Santa, he has to put his differences with Harold aside to rescue him when he doesn't return home one night. Percy actually felt like a real character again, with actual struggles. But if you ask me, there is no better Percy overcoming adversity story than the 2014 movie, Tale of the Brave. This movie successfully achieved what Day of the Diesels was trying to do. A Thomas and Percy story where their friendship is truly tested. The strain on their friendship here feels real. It's not the, we're the best of friends and love each other always that the previous writers always fed us. When I'm with you, I feel most proud of all, and most special of all. That's exactly how I feel when I'm with you. No, it actually gets kind of ugly this time, and you understand both characters' motives and feelings. There's two plots happening at once, and they come together pretty beautifully in the second act. One plot is about Thomas investigating giant footprints he saw at the clay pits. After a lot of asking questions and getting nowhere, he concludes he must have been seeing things. Monsters surely don't exist. Maybe I didn't see anything that night. <laughs> Maybe the lightning was playing tricks on me. Percy catches wind of this monster sighting, and meanwhile is dealing with his own fears. One night, Percy believes that he saw the monster, runs back in fear and embarrasses himself, and then begs Thomas to back him up in front of everyone. Thomas can't believe him because of his own findings and backstabs him in front of everyone. Tell them, Thomas! You saw those enormous footprints! Tell them! Uh, well, I don't know what I saw, Percy, or what you saw either, but I don't think it could have really been a monster. Understandably, Percy is hurt, embarrassed, angry, feels betrayed, and Thomas is pretty remorseful for it. I thought at least you were my friend. But I am your friend, Percy. No, you're not. Friends believe each other. They both do some pretty irrational things as a result of this fallout, including Percy attempting to leave Sodor to show how brave he really is, and Thomas putting Cranky in danger to stop the ship he thinks Percy is on, in what is a very tense scene for a kid's movie. Cranky almost died here. God damn! After Percy actually is brave and saves James from a treacherous landslide, the two eventually overcome their falling out and make up. I hope we're still friends. <laughs> of course we are! We all are! They grow like real people. And at the end of this movie, they feel like changed characters. Percy was sad to say goodbye to his new friend, but he was happy that he still had his old friends beside him. God, I love this movie. Tale of the Brave really could have been the series finale, and I would have been totally content with that. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention Gator here. Gator was a new character in the movie that Percy really took a liking to. Not only was it nice to see a new character have a meaningful dynamic with someone other than Thomas for once, but it was nice that he was a role model for Percy. Gator taught Percy a very valuable lesson, what it means to actually be brave. Being brave isn't the same as not feeling scared. Being brave is about what you do, even when you do feel scared. And is very real with him when the brave deed Percy decides to do 
is actually pretty cowardly. I'm going to work in a faraway land and show everyone how brave I can be. Well, running away from your problems is not very brave, Percy. To my delight, they actually stuck to this character growth in the following season. Gator is remembered, and this scared version of Percy just wasn't a thing for a good two seasons or so. Like, for instance, in the season 19 episode Wild Water Rescue, Percy gets stuck at a creepy abandoned quarry, but he isn't scared about it. He's mostly just sad that it happened. If this were an episode before Tale of the Brave, no doubt Percy would have been trembling in fear here. I really do love how strong the continuity was in these couple years. But unfortunately, as is par for the course with the CGI series, this status quo change did not last for much longer. By the time season 20 came around, they sort of forgot that this huge stepping stone happened. In the episode 3 Steam Engines Gruff, Percy returns to being scared of monsters again. This time, he's afraid of a cow! Whoa! God damn it. They even redo the whole getting scared while pulling the mail train and raising back to the sheds and fright thing again. Everyone featured is weirdly out of character in this episode. Percy's a scared wimp again. Toby is irrationally worried and doesn't care about his friend's well-being. I'm going for Well, damn, okay. And Thomas is the straight man? None of this is right. <laughs> oh good, we even get some scared Henry in this too. My favorite. I do love season 20. It's definitely the best CGI season, but it's a mixed bag for Percy, unfortunately. We got a great Percy episode with Letters to Santa that follows up his rivalry with Harold, but then we also got this. Don't eat me! Don't eat me! Don't eat me! That's the CGI era for you. Always one tremendous step forward, and then two steps back. I really wonder if Three Steam Engines Gruff was like a holdover from a previous season or something, because it doesn't match the feel of the rest of season 20 at all, in my opinion. The 2016 movie, The Great Race, also featured this rather down-on-himself, timid version of Percy that doesn't really feel true to the character. Percy's the one who's competing, not me. No. Thomas, I don't want to. I might lose. Nonsense, Percy. Things, of course, only get worse as we move into the Big World Big Adventures era. In the Season 23 episode, Panicky Percy, which may just be the worst Percy episode of all time, Percy overly panics that Thomas is in trouble or something, and he gets so scared that he goes really fast and derails and... I, I can't even be bothered to recap this. This episode is just awful. Horrible way to send Percy off. God, I hate Bwaba. And that's... That's just about where Percy's story ends. Percy in CGI definitely had some peaks. There are times where his friendship with Thomas felt real, especially in Tale of the Brave. I love that they continue to explore his dynamics with other characters like Harold, James, the Diesels, and even new characters like Gator. And there are significant moments where his character is tested and he develops. I genuinely love some of the CGI Percy episodes. There are a lot of high points, but the fact they didn't stick to this development undermines it all. The wonderful conclusion of Tale of the Brave really feels kind of lessened, knowing Percy didn't stick to any of the growth he experienced in that movie. Now, I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, because honestly, me being kind of hard on the CGI seasons is becoming a trend in these videos. But I want to make this clear. Percy is not the worst we've seen from the CGI series. Many others have had it much worse. I still think Henry is the biggest offender when it comes to character assassination. <laughs> what did they do to you, Big Green? Percy's journey over the years has been one with many ups and downs. I wouldn't say any of the eras fully got him wrong, as he's had such extremely good episodes and story arcs in all of them. He's had his share of bad ones too, but that's par for the course with most of the main characters. Not every episode in a show with 24 seasons is going to be a banger. Now, of the three eras, 
which would I say is my favorite? I'm of course inclined to choose the Railway series, but I'm going to go with Model series for this one. The Model series did Percy kinda dirty towards its end, yes, but it just did more with the character than the books did. There's so many more new elements at play with him, and it built upon all those friendships and rivalries that were set up in the books, developing them, and they even invented a few of their own. I love the sort of growing up arc that he had in those first five seasons. Starting as a happy, cheeky scamp, to being relocated, having a reluctant work colleague turn genuine friendship with Thomas, and all the friends and rivals that he made along the way. Not to mention the absolute savage he was in Season 5. If I could have it any way, I think the best version of Percy would be some sort of amalgamation of all three eras. Give me a version of Percy that has the history from the books, the rivalries and friendships from the model series, and the character development he experienced in Tale of the Brave. That's my ideal Percy. Percy is wonderful because he represents childhood innocence. A wide-eyed, explosive, happy soul that is yet to be tainted by greed, pride, or status. None of that matters to Percy. He is more curious about the world around him, learning his limits and what he can get away with, and the scrapes he gets himself into over the years are all results of that. And when he does get mad, it's not because of selfishness or blasts to his ego, but because he's been wrongly treated. He can be vengeful, but never malicious in intent. There's something really beautiful about Percy. In a series full of engines that are so prideful and savage and full of themselves, it's nice having that one little soul that is yet to be tainted. Cheeky, blissfully innocent, and ultimately good. And it's no wonder why we all find him so lovable because of that. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I know Percy is one you've all been waiting for, and I hope you all think I did him justice. Hopefully, I hit on everything. The bigger characters are usually more of a challenge to write these for. I apologize for my mic quality here. Uh, I'm actually recording this away from home at the moment. That intro sequence was truly a group effort, and it wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for the help I had from Jacob Jarrett, aka the creator of Project Tiger Moth, who edited so many of the shots used in it. Thank you for all the help, Jacob. And a special shout out to all the voice actors. Tom Marshall once again taking part and lending his voice this time for Sir Topham Hat. Kyle, aka Trampy, as the shop owner and Robin Edwards as Percy. You all three absolutely killed it. Just want to throw up some updates for the Patreon here. Controller tier was updated at the beginning of the year with new perks. Patrons now get access to clips from new big videos as I work on them. For instance, the entire complete intro sequence to the Sodor's Finest was uploaded at the beginning of this week. Controller and Fireman tiers also have access to monthly Q&As, which occur at the beginning of each month. Once again, a big thank you to all my patrons for their continued support. You all are awesome. That's all from me, folks. I will see you all in the next one.